so just like the treatment of monoprotic acids um, that we that we talked quite a bit about in chapter nine, um, when we talk about diprotic acids, so that's sort of one proton more, um, exact solutions to systematic treatment are cumbersome. Um, and so in that case, use a computer. And, th and that's what you'll you'll learn how to use hydrogen medusa in this class. Um, so we're not gonna, at least I'm not gonna have you explicitly derive exact solutions or solve cubic functions for systematic treatment of diprotic acids. It gets complicated, right? It was complicated with monoprotic acids. Now you've got a whole other species in equilibrium with the original acid. Um, and so things get really complicated in considering that. And so um, approximations are really helpful. And we'll, I'm going to walk you through uh, solving these with approximations, which is what more or less you learned how to do in Chem 108. But we're going to sort of reframe it from the perspective of what you learned in Chem 108 was not exact. It was approximate. And so now we're going to do it deliberately with, deliberately with an approximation and then learn to know when you should use an approximation, when it's okay to do it by hand and uh, have an approximation, and when you should use exact solutions via systematic treatment. Um, I'll also show you that I have solved these by hand, as I mentioned before. Remember that document's available to you, that's that long PDF I showed you. So the this is section two of this, so um, we're down on page three, but the first couple pages show you how to solve explicitly that cubic function, or at least derive that cubic function for a weak monoprotic acid. This is the derivation of weak diprotic acid um, from the perspective of just starting with H2A. So you've got H2A and you toss that into solution. Um, so you start out with the reactions that you have. Of course, you have H2A that dissociates, but then you have HA that dissociates, and of course you have the dissociation of water. We write out all three equilibria. We write a charge balance for this. Uh, we write a mass balance for this. I give you some notes on the side for sort of what I was thinking when I was doing this. Then I go through this substitutional solution process, which is enormously cumbersome and only useful if you don't um, use linear algebra. Um, but it's fine if you want to sort of walk through the process. Again, I'll never have you derive this. This is simply a supplement for you to understand that uh, I'm, not, I'm not lying to you. You can do this. Um, <laughs> not fun. So, um, and then I walk you through a couple simplifications that you could make uh, or approximations, which is what we're going to do uh, in the, the rest of this video, which will lead us to um, the, the quadratic that looks like this. Um, and then you can see like situation three is when you have a weak acid plus a conjugate base salt. So you've got both of these two things in solution. These are monoprotics. How you'd go about solving that explicitly. This is a little bit, um, a little bit easier. And then I go through the simplifications there, which are um, a little bit cumbersome. And then the last scenario here that's relevant to polyprotic systems is you've got the conjugate base of a diprotic acid. So uh, example two was just when you tossed H2A into solution. Now, how do you go about solving this explicitly when you're not adding H2A, but you're adding the dibasic version of H2A, meaning uh, A2 minus? And you would add that in a salt form by just adding two sodiums attached to that A, so Na2A. So same reaction, same equilibria. Go through um, the, the solution process, um, and it gets fairly complicated, um, but you can go through this and follow it if it's relevant to you. Um, I, I like to do this for my own understanding, um, just to convince myself I know what's going on and develop that intuition. I'm not sure if it helped at all, uh, but now you have this PDF you can look at uh, if you want. Okay, so what I'm going to walk you through are just some approximate solutions of some scenarios um, for if you have different versions or different species of a diprotic acid and you put it in water. So the first and obvious one is if you just have the fully protonated version H2A and you put that in water. How do we go about computing the concentrations of the relevant species and also the pH? As I just mentioned, the exact solution to this is the second part of that PDF handout. But later uh, in that handout, you'll see a section called um, solution for an amphoteric salt. By amphoteric, I mean uh, something like HA minus, where it's both an acid and a base. And that's what I'll talk about next is a solution of just HA minus. How do we go about solving that? So the first sort of approximation, which um, is a huge one, is that um, we're going to treat H2A as monoprotic. And, and that's a pretty valid approximation that works pretty well, as long as the first Ka for the dissociation of H2A, as long as that's considerably larger, and by larger, um, 
it's got to be roughly, I'd say, at least, um, you know, uh, let's see, at least a thousandfold, ten to the third. The reason for that is if it's a thousandfold, then any difference, any contribution from uh, the second dissociation step is only going to manifest in this third significant figure. Um, and so it just depends, again, on how many digits you're considering or how much error you're trying to limit in your computation. If Ka1 is a lot bigger, a thousand to ten thousand times larger, then this approximation is usually really sound and it's going to manifest again as uh, less than 0.1% uh, error. So let's go through what that looks like. So if this thing is treated as monoprotic, then really it's H2A is really just like HA. And then this, this approximation becomes pretty simple. Um, the sort of implicit approximation here is that if it's uh, if we're treating it as monoprotic uh, and we're also neglecting any contribution from the dissociation of water, saying that the this thing is weak, but it's not that weak. So we're we're really saying that the K the approximation works here if Ka1 is considerably larger than Ka2, and by considerably larger, we also mean that it's quite a bit larger than uh, 10 to the minus 7. Um, again, because otherwise we have to consider uh, the systematic contribution of dissociation of water to protons from that. If this is the case, then this approximation is a pretty reasonable one, and this is the approximation you would have made in like a Chem 108 course. So we'll walk through that, but now from the perspective that this was totally uh, just sort of luck of the draw in Chem 108, you were given problems where this approximation was sound without really ever being told that it was an approximation and that it was a small subspace of the larger chemical equilibrium space uh, and it doesn't always work that way. But if it does, and this is monoprotic, which means that uh, this uh, dissociation of HA, uh, oops, not HA, but uh, A2 minus, what we're essentially saying is this step Ka2 is so tiny that we are going to just negate all of that and so whatever H2A or whatever H plus is in solution, it's simply from the H2A dissociation and we're not going to contribute uh, or consider any H plus that comes from the second dissociation step. That's the implication of this finding. So to solve this, it's pretty straightforward, uh, just like you would have done for a really simple monoprotic. You would have had the original formal concentration of H2A depending on the solution that you're adding. That's the formal concentration F. And so our final equilibrium would have been whatever the formal concentration is minus how much of it dissociated and the concentration of H plus would have just been X and HA would have been X, right? This is sort of the shortcut to the ice table. This is just like an E table. Uh, and so if we write this up as an equilibrium, what that gives us is x squared over f minus x equal to ka. So really, really straightforward. And by ka, I mean ka1 specifically for that first dissociation step. So that approximation is valid, again, when the first k is quite a bit larger than the second, usually on the order of a thousand times greater. Uh, but again, it's up to you, depending on the end use of this data, and also that it's sufficiently large um, that it is significantly larger than 10 to the minus 7. And it's sort of requisite. If Ka1 is already going to be a thousand times bigger than Ka2, then almost by definition, it's going to be uh, quite a bit larger than 10 to the minus 7. So that's almost implicit, which allows us then to do this really simple uh, solution to figure out what the concentration of H plus is, uh, and it minimizes error down to less than 0.1% as long as this approximation holds. So uh, if we compute this, since X is H plus and H A minus is X, and we can then uh, solve this, oops, I'll do this in green, um, the solution to this will give us the concentration of H A minus, uh, H plus, uh, and H two A, but it doesn't tell us what the concentration of a2 minus is, uh, we negated the contribution of H plus uh, in computing this, but H plus is H plus. Whatever the H plus is here, that's the H plus here. So uh, even e there, if there is H plus in solution, we can use that to then compute whatever is left over. Uh, and so we can do that just by using uh, the K2 equilibrium or the Ka2 equilibrium. So the Ka2 equilibrium would have been uh, concentration of H plus 
times A2 minus uh, divided by concentration of HA minus uh, is equal to Ka2. I'm just grabbing, uh, maybe it's easier if I delete uh, this sort of blue section. So I'm just grabbing this second section here um, and writing that up as the second dissociation step. And don't be confused, just because we didn't employ it to compute our H plus and our HA doesn't mean that it's not still relevant because the A2 can't be zero. It's just small and, uh, and really small, and that's why we didn't need to contribute the H plus. But we still may be interested in roughly what its concentration is. So we rearrange this. This becomes Ka2 times HA minus divided by HA or H plus. Um, we know this. We know this because those are simply x uh, here. And if those are simply x over x, right? This becomes uh, well. Let, let, let me let me write it out. Let's not go too fast here. This becomes Ka2. Uh, x over x, um, simply because H plus and HA are the same. Uh, that allows us to get rid of those. And so the approximate concentration of A2 minus is just going to be equal to Ka2. And that's kind of an interesting finding. Of course, that's only true under this approximation. But again, this approximation is going to give you, as long as you uphold this sort of 10 to the third or 10 to the fourth, it's going to keep you in the 0.1 to 0.01% error range. And so it, it actually gives you a pretty, pretty accurate number. Okay, so the second solution condition is just if you had HA minus, uh, meaning like you had a salt of HA minus, maybe you had sodium HA or potassium HA, and you got that in the lab, you tossed it into a beaker. How do you compute the concentrations of all the stuff and ultimately the pH of the system? Well, first approximation we're going to make, and we'll see if this makes sense to you, is that the concentration of HA is going to be roughly equal to the concentration that you added, the formal concentration. What does that mean? Well, you've got this system uh, where you've got H2A uh, that dissociates to make HA minus plus H plus, which dissociates to make A2 minus plus H plus again, that uh, Ka1 uh, and Ka2. And what you've just done is just plop this thing, which is right in the middle of two equilibria going the opposite directions, and plop that into a beaker of water. What's going to happen? Well, let's sort of rationalize this. We already know that Ka2 is tiny. Uh, and by definition, Ka2 has to be considerably smaller than Ka1. Uh, so if that's true, it's not really going to proceed this direction very much, right? It, it's already a tiny ratio of A2 minus to HA minus. Uh, at the same time, if the, if the, um, Ka1 uh, is fairly small going in this direction. Let's just say the Ka1 uh, was like 10 to the minus 4. Let's just, let's just you know, spitball here. Uh, Ka1 is roughly 10 to the minus 4. Then the Kb, which would be this thing, uh, and actually this would be the Kb2, just to confuse you, extra, uh, this being Kb1 over here. Um, the KB, how do we compute the KB2? Well, if, um, let me just give you that, that 4 looked a little weird. So there's 4. KB2 uh, and KB and KA1 are related to each other um, because they're uh, the sort of opposite going direction or reactions. That has to be equal to KW, which is, of course, equal to 10 to the minus 14. So in this case, uh, if we wanted to compute KB2 from KA1, that would be um, 10 to the minus 14 over Ka1, which was 10 to the minus 4, which gives us 10 to the minus 10, which is a tiny, tiny number. So Ka2 is really tiny uh, going this way, which means it doesn't go, and Kb2 going this way is also really tiny. So the approximation is pretty reasonable, which just means if you toss the Ha minus into a solution, which I should say is the amphoteric uh, salt, that's what we call this because it's both acid and base, it can go either way, it's pretty much locked into position because the equilibrium for either direction for it to be a base or an acid are not favorable. So a tiny trickle is going to turn into A2- minus, and a tiny trickle is going to turn into H2A, but not considerable enough so this approximation is reasonable.
So if this approximation holds, then the really the simplest way to compute the hydrogen ion concentration or the, the pH for this system uh, comes from the fact that because this thing is immobile and it's stuck halfway between um, these two reactions, then literally we can compute then the pH uh, as halfway between the two pKa's, uh, pKa1 and pKa2. And, and that just comes from sort of this notion that when pH is equal to pKa1, we've got an equal concentration of both of these. When pH is equal to pKa2, we've got an equal concentration of these two things. When we have most of the form in HA, then we must be halfway between those two scenarios, which would be halfway between those two pKa's. Um, we'll show this on a um, titration curve, and it'll make a little bit more intuitive sense. Um, if this approximation doesn't hold, or if you want an exact solution of this every single time, uh, you can look at my derived equation, uh, which also is in your textbook, uh, from the PDF. And that derived equation states that um, the hydrogen ion concentration, uh, if you know, if this, this approximation doesn't hold, um, then the exact solution gives you uh, H plus is equal to root K1, K2, times the formal concentration of uh, that uh, amphoteric salt that you added times K1 times KW divided by K1 plus F. 99.9% .9 of the time, the approximation will hold unless it doesn't, unless you have, you know, uh, a pKa um, 1 and 2 that are, you know, drastically different. In other words, if pKa2 is actually quite large with respect to pKa1, um, then if they're pretty close to each other within, say, um, a hundredfold to a thousandfold, if they get pretty close to each other, then that means that there's going to be an appreciable amount of A2 minus that gets generated. That's going to drive the concentration of HA down. It's going to shift all of the equilibria to the right, and it's going to produce more protons. Um, that's going to lead to greater error if you use this expression, in which case the systematic expression is going to be the best. Um, but 99.9% .9 of the time, using both of these expressions are going to give you exactly the same result within three significant figures. If you're looking for six or seven, then, um, then the latter is going to be um, better. So again, the, the intuition that you're trying to strive for here is to really think about the interplay of um, the Ka values and how they impact the equilibrium concentration and the dominant species. And if they get close to each other or if they're far away from each other, if one is much greater than the other, how does that impact what's in solution at any given time? And then ultimately dictate to you whether you think it's wise to go down the road of approximating or whether it's wise to think about this thing systematic. So this, the, either way, either one of these will give you um, H plus either directly or indirectly as pH, but if you want to get the concentrations of the rest of the species, that's pretty easy because you have the Ka1 and Ka2, so you just write up the equilibrium expressions for each and then solve them once you have the H+. plus. So for example, to solve for H2A concentration, that would just be HA um, multiplied by H+, plus divided by um, K1, and you would, um, so all I did was just rearrange the equilibrium expression for the, this first dissociation step to solve for H2A. Um, and then you have H plus, because that's what you just solved for, and then HA, HA uh, minus here, uh, we're using this approximation, um, the formal concentration. So whatever you added, that's the value that goes in there. Um, so I'll also say the formal concentration, sometimes I'll write this, and you'll see this in my PDF, um, I often write this as initial, concentration because that's the concentration before it precedes the equilibrium. So I'll write HA and then I'll put a subscript zero there just to indicate that that's like time zero before it proceeds, which in principle is the same thing as the formal concentration because formal concentration is what you have, what you added, but it's not always what you have at equilibrium because things are going to re-equilibrate um, based on whatever their equilibrium constants are. All right, so the last solution that we need to talk about then is just the fully basic version, the A2 minus. Uh, and the approximation here, uh, if we don't want to treat this systematically, is that we're going to assume that A2 uh, minus is monobasic, meaning it's not going to proceed all the way to make H2A. And it's only going to react a little tiny bit to make HA. So you can sort of see the theme here, right? In all these three solution scenarios of H2A, HA minus, and A2 minus, 
what we're really assuming is that that reaction, whatever that particular species is, um, it's only going to participate in one reaction or really no reactions at all for the HA minus. Um, so we really simplify things. And again, that's like it's mostly based on how large the Ka values and how large they are relative to each other. Uh, and so most of the time, this is actually a reasonable approximation. Um, and so in this case, it's actually a pretty good thought because if we have, let me pause and I'll just draft this up really quick to save time. So remember, if we have the full expression here, so H2A, a, HA minus, and H2 minus, um, that first association from H2A is going to be K1, uh, and then the second association is K2. But if we're thinking about A2 minus, it's the only thing in solution, it's going backwards. That's a basic step, which is actually the first base association constant, or KB1, and KB2 is related then to KA1. So uh, I mentioned this in the, in the, earlier in the video. Um, if the Ka2 is already tiny, let's just say that it's like um, 10 to the minus 10, um, if, it's, if it's small but not too small, then this is a pretty good approximation. So if we say that maybe this is 10 to the minus, I don't know, 8. So fairly small pKa. What does that mean for Kb1? Well, again, K, uh, B1 multiplied by Ka2, those two things are related because they're equal and opposite. One's the acid form, one's the base form um, through Kw. Then uh, if we solve for um, Kb1, that's going to be 10 to the minus 14 over 10 to the minus 8, which is going to give us a Kb1 of 10 to the minus 6, which means one in a million uh, A2 minuses are going to actually proceed from right to left, and that's a pretty good approximation. You can see though, if Ka2 gets really, really tiny, like 10 to the minus 11, then in that case, uh, this changes right here to minus 11, and this changes to 10 to the minus three, which puts us into like one to one in a thousand range, um, which puts us at the third significant digit, roughly. Um, so as long as the, the Ka2 is small, but not so tiny, that it starts to prop up the KB1, and meaning it goes in the direction of the left, then this is a fairly reasonable approximation. So in that case, we just assume this thing's you know, monobasic, and we toss that into solution. So we have A2 minus reacting with water, which is what this direction is implying here, going backwards in this way. We're not really saying A2 minus plus H, H plus, because that's weak base plus strong acid, which would actually be one over K2, as I described earlier. What we're really saying is if this goes back in the other direction, it's reacting with water uh, via this base reaction that we have here, and that's what KB1 pertains to, in which case um, this becomes pretty easy to solve. Uh, and so we could write out an ice table or just an E table again. So we have the formal concentration, whatever we added. To, of A2 minus to the beaker. Um, that would be the formal original concentration. Some amount X of that is going to dissolve water we don't care about. However much X um, actually associates with water, um, that is going to turn into the same X of HA that gets produced, uh, and then the same X for OH minus that gets produced. So we can draft up a, an expression here. Now relating this to KB1, you have to be careful. So you've got to compute KB1 from this relationship because you were given Ka2 likely. So you would relate that, get KB1, and then set up your equilibrium expression, which would have been HA minus times hydroxide concentration divided by A2 minus concentration. So we know KB1, we um, have a formal concentration of A2 minus that we can toss in there, uh, or F minus X. So we, we, we restate uh, this as X over X, uh, F minus X is equal to KB1, and we solve for X. That'll give us hydroxide, that'll give us HA, that'll give us A2 minus. To get to H2A minus, we do the same thing that we did in the first case of H2A, where we then just write up a quick um, Ka1 is equal to HA minus H plus uh, divided by H2A. We will have already computed HA. Uh, we will have computed H plus because we know OH minus, so we can figure that out. We know K1, 
and so we can find out what H2A is. So that's how you would go through and, and figure out all the concentrations of everything in the solution. Why did I walk through these three different scenarios? Well, these three different scenarios are the three different parts of a titration curve. Those are these, the scenarios that you'll be faced with. We already know the key metrics of um, when pH is equal to pKa, so we'll have these nice key inflection points, uh, but then we'll also have mechanisms at any point along the titration curve for a monoprotic or a diprotic acid now to compute these values. That's really setting the stage for that.